Welcome everyone to this video on genitourinary dysfunction. We'll be exploring various conditions affecting the kidneys, bladder, and related structures. All right, class, let's talk about pee and everything that controls it. The genitourinary system may not get as much hype as the heart or lungs, but when it's not working, you'll know. This system filters waste, balances fluids, and yes, affects blood pressure too. If your patient is suddenly swelling, fatigued, or urinating strangely, this system is your suspect. Let's begin with a review of the genitourinary system's anatomy and physiology. Understanding the structure of the kidney, including the nephron, is crucial for grasping how dysfunction manifests. We'll also touch on key clinical manifestations and relevant lab tests. Picture the nephron as a coffee filter. It filters blood to make urine while keeping important stuff like protein and glucose in the bloodstream. When this filter breaks, that's when protein shows up in urine, swelling begins, and we have a problem. Knowing this structure helps us decode lab results and symptoms. Urinary tract infections are a common concern, especially in pediatric populations. It's often challenging to pinpoint the exact location of the infection. Keep in mind the higher incidence in uncircumcised infants and young females. In kids, UTIs might not always look textbook. A toddler with a fever and no clear source? Think UTI. A baby who's fussy and not eating? Yep, could be a UTI too. Uncircumcised baby boys and young girls under 12 months are more prone. Early detection, you less kidney damage. UTIs can be classified in several ways, including bacteriuria, puria, and whether they are symptomatic or asymptomatic. We also differentiate between recurrent, persistent, febrile, and more severe forms like pilonephritis and urosepsis. Symptomatic you'll see fever, pain, burning, asymptomatic, sneaky, and often missed. Pylonephritis, that's an upper tract infection. Think fever and back pain. Eurosepsis, that's when things go south fast. If the child has a high fever and you can't find a reason, always consider a UTI. When should you suspect a UTI in a child? Look for signs like incontinence in toilet trained children strong smelling urine, or frequent and painful urination. Diagnostic tools range from urine cultures to advanced imaging techniques. Painful peeing or peeing more often? Classic, but kids can also just be cranky, not eating, or have unexplained fever. We use urine cultures and sometimes imaging to figure out what's going on especially if it's a repeat infection. Vesicoretiral reflux, or VUR, involves the backward flow of urine. Primary reflux often stems from anatomical issues, while secondary reflux is acquired. VUR significantly increases the risk of febrile UTIs and potential kidney damage. Think of urine as a one-way street, down and out. In VUR, it flows backward toward the kidneys, carrying bacteria with it. This invites repeated infections and long-term kidney damage. VUR can be congenital or acquired. Let me give you this clinical tip. Kids with frequent febrile UTIs should be evaluated for VUR using a voiding cystoarthrogram, VQG. The prognosis for UTIs is generally good with prompt treatment. However, be aware of the risk of renal injury, especially with VUR. Care management involves careful observation, proper specimen collection, and thorough parent education. Antibiotics are great, but the real job is preventing recurrence and catching VUR early. Teach parents about hygiene, how to collect clean urine samples, and when to return. If not managed well, Scarring can occur and lead to hypertension or renal failure. Obstructive uropathy refers to structural or functional blockages in the urinary tract. This can lead to urine backup and hydronephrosis. 
early diagnosis and surgical intervention are often critical to prevent long-term damage. Imagine traffic backing up on a highway. That's what happens in the kidneys when urine can't flow out. This can stretch and damage kidney structures. It's not always visible, so we rely on imaging like ultrasounds to catch it early. Most cases require surgical correction. Let's look at this clinical scenario. A newborn with poor urine output is found to have posterior urethral valves causing obstruction. Early surgery prevents kidney damage. Enuresis, or bedwetting, is a common problem in children. It's defined as involuntary urination at night, occurring frequently in children over five. Rule out any underlying medical conditions before considering behavioral or pharmacological interventions. Let's be real, bedwetting is tough on kids and parents, but it's more common than you think. Before you label it behavioral, rule out physical causes like a UTI, diabetes, or constipation. Once that's clear, you can talk about bladder training, limiting fluids at night, and even bedwetting alarm. Phimosis, the narrowing of the foreskin opening, is often a normal finding that resolves on its own. However, it can sometimes lead to complications like balanitis. Steroid creams can be helpful, but severe cases may require circumcision. This is normal in babies and usually resolves with time. But if a child develops pain, ballooning during urination, or infections, now it's a problem. Topical steroid creams can help loosen things up. Circumcision is a last resort, not a first response. A hydrocele is a collection of peritoneal fluid in the scrotum. Most hydrocele's resolve spontaneously within the first year of life. If surgery is needed, advise parents about temporary swelling and activity restrictions post-op. Parents may panic seeing a swollen scrotum, but most hydrocele's are painless and resolve by age one. If it persists or gets huge, surgery may be needed. Always rule out a hernia though. It's a surgical emergency if it's trapped. Cryptorchidism or undescended testis is a condition where one or both testes fail to descend properly. Surgical management is typically required to position the testes in the scrotum, which can help preserve fertility. If the testicles aren't in the scrotum by six months, they probably won't come down on their own. Surgery helps prevent fertility issues and testicular cancer. This isn't just cosmetic. It matters for long-term health. Hypospadias is a congenital condition where the urethral opening is located on the underside of the penis. Surgical correction is usually performed between 6 and 12 months to improve voiding and sexual function. This can range from mild to severe. We don't circumcise these babies early. Foreskin may be used in the surgical repair. The goal is to ensure normal urination and sexual function later in life. Timing for surgery, usually between 6 to 12 months. The extrophy epispadias complex is a severe birth defect involving multiple systems. It results from incomplete fusion of the abdominal wall and other structures. This complex condition requires a multidisciplinary approach. The bladder may be on the outside of the body. It's dramatic and rare. These babies need immediate protection of exposed organs and a specialized team to surgically rebuild the bladder and pelvic area over time. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Care management for extrophy epispadias complex focuses on protecting exposed structures, monitoring urinary output, and managing pain. Routine wound care, self-catheterization, and parental support are also essential. Use sterile, non-adherent dressings to keep tissues moist and prevent infection. Monitor output with diapers or catheter. These families need emotional support. This isn't easy news to hear. Disorders of sex development involve discrepancies between external genitalia and sex chromosomes. These conditions require careful evaluation and management, often involving a team of specialists. 
this is sensitive terrain. DSD may show up as ambiguous genitalia at birth. It's crucial not to rush gender assignment. Testing for chromosomes, hormone levels, and imaging comes first. A multidisciplinary team guides the family. Nephrotic syndrome is characterized by glomerular damage leading to proteinuria and edema. Massive albuminuria, hematuria, and hypertension are common findings. Treatment focuses on managing fluid balance and dietary modifications. Imagine the kidneys filter getting so leaky that protein spills into urine. Now, there's not enough protein in the blood to hold fluid in, so it leaks into tissues. Hello, edema. Kids swell up like balloons, especially around the eyes. The pathophysiology of nephrotic syndrome involves a cascade of events triggered by glomerular damage. Proteinuria leads to hypoproteinemia, decreased oncotic pressure, and ultimately edema. Less protein in the blood, each less pressure to hold fluid in vessels, so fluid leaks out into tissues. The liver tries to help by making more lipids, hence the hyperlipidemia we see in labs. Diagnosing nephrotic syndrome relies on clinical manifestations and laboratory findings. Look for massive proteinuria on dipstick, low serum albumin, and potentially elevated platelets. Dipstick urine often shows 3 plus or 4 plus protein. Serum albumin is low. Platelets and cholesterol may be high. Often the diagnosis is clear from labs and appearance. Let's take this clinical note. These kids often have normal blood pressure unless there's secondary disease involved. Therapeutic management of nephrotic syndrome includes supportive care, reducing protein excretion, and preventing infection. Corticosteroids are often used, and close monitoring for complications is crucial. Prednisone is the go-to. Monitor for side effects like weight gain, mood swings, or Cushingoid appearance. Salt restriction helps manage swelling. Prevent infection. It's a major risk in these immunosuppressed kids. Acute glomerulonephritis often follows a streptococcal infection. This can lead to a latent period before symptoms manifest. Immune complex diseases can also trigger glomerulonephritis. Let's say a kid has strep throat, doesn't finish their antibiotics, and then a couple weeks later, their face is puffy and they're peeing coke-colored urine. That's glomerulonephritis. The immune system gets overexcited and attacks the glomeruli the tiny filters in the kidneys. Key symptoms of glomerulonephritis include oliguria, edema, and hypertension. Hematuria, causing smoky-colored urine and proteinuria, are also characteristic findings. Smoky or tea-colored urine, chas blood. Puffy face, has edema. Headache, could be due to high blood pressure. These kids may be tired and cranky too. You won't always see fever at this point. It's more about what the kidneys are doing. Diagnostic evaluation for acute glomerulonephritis includes a history of strep infection, urinalysis, and blood tests. X-rays and renal biopsy may also be necessary in some cases. You'll likely see hematuria and proteinuria in the urine. Blood work may show elevated bone and creatinine. And don't forget the ASO titer it can confirm a recent strep infection. Another clinical tip, ask about sore throat one, two weeks before symptoms started. Managing acute glomerulonephritis involves addressing edema, providing appropriate nutrition, and preventing infections. Careful monitoring of vital signs, fluid balance, and body weight is essential. These kids need careful fluid balance, monitor weight, INOs, and BP. We usually limit sodium and protein. Sometimes antihypertensives or diuretics are needed. Most recover fully at home, but some need hospitalization if their symptoms are severe. The prognosis for acute post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis is generally excellent in children. Specific immunity is conferred and recurrences are uncommon. The good news? Most kids get better with rest and monitoring. It's rare for them to need dialysis unless it's a severe case. 
Once they recover, their immunity builds up and recurrence is rare. Care management for acute glomerulonephritis requires an interprofessional approach. Regular monitoring of vital signs and fluids, seizure precautions, and dietary modifications are important. Vital signs, especially BP, are your best friend. Watch for seizure signs due to high BP. Daily weights are more reliable than output sometimes. Collaborate with dietitians and teach families how to support low-sodium diets at home. Acute kidney injury, or AKI, involves a sudden inability to regulate urine volume and composition. Oliguria, azotemia, and electrolyte disturbances are common. Poor renal perfusion and urinary tract obstruction are frequent causes. Causes range from dehydration to toxins to obstructive uropathy. The kidneys stop filtering effectively, leading to buildup of waste, fluid, and electrolyte imbalances. Symptoms include decreased urine, lethargy, and swelling. Let's look at this clinical scenario. A teen on NSAIDs for a sports injury gets dehydrated and develops AKI classic setup. Acute renal failure is usually reversible. The typical progression involves oliguria, followed by diuresis and a return toward normal. Treatment focuses on addressing the underlying cause and managing complications. In the oliguric phase, urine drops dramatically. Then comes the flood, diuretic phase, where they pee a lot but still can't concentrate urine well. Finally, in the recovery phase, labs and kidney function normalize. The goal is to support them through all three. Complications of acute renal failure include water intoxication, hyperkalemia, and hypertension. Anemia, seizures, and cardiac failure with pulmonary edema can also occur. Hyperkalemia can cause dangerous arrhythmias. Hypertension, anemia, and even seizures may follow. If untreated, the patient can go into multi-organ failure. This is why labs and ECG monitoring are critical. Let's take this emergency. Tip, high potassium. Give calcium gluconate, insulin plus glucose, and consider dialysis. The prognosis for acute kidney injury depends on the severity of the underlying cause. While complete recovery is possible, some patients may experience residual renal impairment or hypertension. Most kids bounce back if it's caught early, but if there's delayed treatment or underlying illness, there could be permanent kidney damage or future risk of hypertension. Regular follow-ups are key. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe for more videos like this.